Welcome to this unboxing and build video on the Acasa Newton TN for the Intel NUC 11 Pro. This video is divided into three parts, a quick unboxing, the build itself, and a performance and roundup section. So feel free to skip ahead if a later section interests you more. The links for all of the components used in this video can be found down in the description. The Newton TM comes in a fairly inauspicious commercial brown box package. First out of the box is a flexi PCB used to connect the SATA 3 header. And next we have the rest of the accessories pack. These longitudinal brackets support an optional 2.5 inch SATA 3 drive. The feet and assortment of different mounting screws. The thermal pad set and a small syringe of CASA thermal grease. This pack contains screws for the 2.5 inch drive mounting assembly, the SATA drive connector and the optional RS232 serial header. So addendum instructions. This plastic film turned out to be a shield to ensure that the case or PCB of a 2.5 inch drive is insulated from the motherboard electronics below it. Finally the main assembly guide, which are primarily visual in nature, although a multilingual key is provided down in the bottom corner. This is the SATA assembly grouped together, I will not be using it in this build and the serial port connector itself, again not used. The case itself is a hefty chunk of aluminium, very solid, sturdy and nicely made with no jagged edges. On the front there are two USB 2 ports and two USB 3.2 port pass-throughs. A power indicator and hard drive activity indicator, configurable in the BIOS, and of course the power button. The sides and top have an almost uniform fin spacing, with 5mm spacings on 2mm fins over three sides. The brushed aluminium continues on the back of the 200 by 177 by 54mm case, with mounting holes available for wall or possibly VESA mounting at 100 by 100 mm spacing. The rear I.O. mirrors that of the NUC 11 with a few additions. On the left a Kensington lock port and at the bottom grommeted Wi-Fi antenna ports. 12 volt power, dual Thunderbolt 4 ports, dual HDMI 2.0B ports in the middle, the Ethernet port, a single USB 3.2 port and a USB 2 port. By comparison, the case is almost four times the size of the NUC 11 TNB V5 board going into it. This is necessary to provide thermal mass to dissipate the 28 watt TDP of this dock. The extra volume is also used to provision space for additional headers as well as space for a 2.5 inch drive bay. If you want your build to support Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you will also need an Akasa A80C01150GR pigtail cable and an A80N01BK Wi-Fi antenna, as regrettably these are not included with the case. To complete the build, we'll be using a 16GB Integral DDR4 3200 kit. I would have used 32GB of low latency Crucial Ballistics CL16, however this had proved impossible to source given current supply shortages. For storage, 
we're using a ubiquitous Samsung 970 Evo Plus 500 gigabyte NVMe. And finally, an Intel AX201 Wi-Fi 6 Bluetooth 5 card for wireless functions. Again, links to all of these parts are down in the description. The first step in the build process is to remove the stock cooler from the Nook 11 board. The first two screws mount the fans of the heat pipe assembly. Don't forget to remove the fan power cable. And note the red cable on the top right is for the CMOS battery and does not need to be removed as I had here. The layout of the cooler has the heatsink fins themselves at the top, the fan assembly and heat pipes at the bottom, and once the fan screws are removed, both are held together with some insulation tape. The tape is semi-rigid and very brittle. If you're careful, starting at one end, you can tease it up while trying not to rip a seam down the middle. I just about managed to get it up here with some needle nose pliers without ripping it in half longitudinally. Once the tape is free, the fan will freely detach without any clips, revealing the copper heat pipe assembly. Removing the heat pipes from the motherboard is simply a case of four screws and lifting the cooler away from the die. Little resistance can be expected from the thermal grease, but it should come away easily, along with the thermal pad which had been covering three of the VRMs. Next we clean the diathermal compound, making everything nice and shiny and ready for reapplication. Starting the assembly, the ACASA instructions are a little unclear in some areas as they represent several parts in the kit using fairly undifferentiated diagrammatic rectangles. And these also include the thermal pads. The main VRM thermal pad is 6mm by 42 by 12, while the secondary VRM is 7 by 19 by 7mm. Starting with the smaller of the two, which covers the VRM and its neighbouring integrated circuit, it is simply a case of peeling off the back and gently squeezing the pad into place once aligned. The process is exactly the same for the larger pad, which this time covers the four main VRMs indicated on the left of the board. It is important to ensure good coverage of these critical components, especially with the smaller pad where the VRM and IC surface profiles are at different heights. Taking the back off of the case, we got our first look inside the tray. The black cable going towards the right is for the front USB 2 headers. The rainbow ribbon, the front panel I.O. and the middle two are the USB 3.2 repeater wires. Returning to the nook, it's time to regrease the die. I decided to just use the included Acasa Pro Grade Plus 5026 compound, using a pea size amount on the main die and half a pea on the secondary. Having foreshadowed this earlier, don't forget, as I clearly did, that you do need to use different motherboard standoffs depending on whether you are installing an i3, i5 or i7 board. Although in practice I couldn't see any difference between them, it's probably a good idea to do it. Having reapplied the compound and taken the top film off of the thermal pads, we place the Nook board on the standoffs again. Align the I.O. to the port cutouts and begin to screw the board in place using the four supplied screws and the non-conductive washers. A gentle hand tightened is more than sufficient.
Next I get the wireless assembly set up. While I do not expressly need wireless LAN or Bluetooth, it made sense to obtain the parts for now while they are still available. This is better than struggling to find them at some future date and time after they've gone out of manufacturing. Attaching the pigtail wires to the wireless card is a bit fiddly, and if possible you should avoid trying to use a tool. I cast a cell a 300mm version of the pigtail, however the 150mm is more than adequate for the Newton TN. The Wi-Fi card is held in place using a spacer nut, which in turn acts as the screw receptacle for the main NVMe SSD slot. A sort of M.2 tower, if you will. The extra front panel USB 2 ports connect via the very small, fiddly, header connectors. An odd design choice is that each one is orientated 180 degrees to the opposite of its peer, meaning that you need to add a twist in the cable in order to make it fit. The front panel I.O. header is fully modular, however note that it does not make use of all of the pins, with several being left exposed towards the RAM slots. Finally, we complete the front panel connectivity by installing the USB 3.2 pass-through cables. These are considerably over length of the case, resulting in there needing to be a twist applied in the cable in order to seat them properly. I'm not sure that this was entirely necessary from a design standpoint, but I'm sure that the designers had their reasons. Oddly, the instruction manual does not mention the wireless assembly at all, or even that the case has grommets for use by Wi-Fi antennas. Their installation though is simple, pull out the rubber grommets, run the wires as you see fit, in hindsight here I should have run them under the board, pass through the threaded end of the pigtail connector and screw the nut and washer onto the thread. Installation of the integral DDR4 SO DIMMs comes next, being careful not to trap the Wi-Fi pigtail wire. and I see the second Wi-Fi connector. Giving them both a gentle hand tighten with some needle nose pliers. And we're almost done now. The final step is to install the thermal solution for the SSD. This comprises of a piece of aluminium sandwiched between two thermal pads and held in place by the case lid. These pads are 71 by 22 by 2 millimeters. I elected not to peel the label sticker off of the SSD in case I need to use its warranty, but don't forget to peel off the film from both sides of the thermal pads. Place the aluminium thermal mass apply the upper pad, and place the bottom piece.
the wireless antennas themselves are a simple matter of screwing them onto the pigtail threads. Last by no means least come the feet. The case ships with screws for three options. Flush mount with no feet. A second option, providing longer screws to use with the rubber tip feet, which I recommend if placing on a surface as the weight of the case makes it awkward to reposition and thus poses a risk of scratching the tabletop. The third option is to use the provided wall mount screws. These slide into the 100 mm recesses on the base plate and allow it to be wall mounted or possibly even VESA mounted if you are industrious enough. The Acasa Newton TN is a small compact solution to achieving a completely silent work environment. The case isn't cheap coming in at around £120 but what you get for that is a solidly built well finished product. The 200 by 177 by 54 mm case makes it considerably larger than the Nook 11 board itself or pre-packaged Intel Nook. This is understandable given that the mass of the case is directly proportionate to its thermal capabilities. Its looks are unashamedly industrial in nature, with no hint of modern gamer aesthetics or integrated RGB for those who value it. Black with silver highlights represents the only colour choice in the wider case range, making it fairly limited for aesthetic builds. An option to have it in white would have represented an appreciated addition, as it would have gone better with the white motif in my office. The two LEDs present on the front can be fully dimmed, reassigned between uses, for, for example power state or hard drive activity, as well as totally disabled in the Nook 11 BIOS. This makes it fairly versatile. It would have been nice to have seen the USB Type-C port on the front panel, however this is a limitation of the Nook itself and not any oversight on the part of Acasa. The couple of extra ports afforded by the Acasa case are welcome, over the already generous I.O. present on the Nook 11 series. Although some more creative options beyond just an RS-232 serial port would seem to be a missed opportunity. The presence of dual Thunderbolt 4 ports on the Nook itself makes the device a particularly enticing option. Thunderbolt gives us the option of using an external GPU dock, something with which the Acasa's case's black industrial look would go well with. To test the thermal performance of the Acasa Newton TN, a thermal probe was placed on the hottest part of the case. Ubuntu 2204 was used with readings taken after an hour of on time to allow the case to settle to a normalised idle temperature. Readings were then taken after 20 minutes of stress testing, and finally a subsequent 20 minutes later, allowing it to cool back down towards idle. The open source stress NG tool was used to stress the CPU, and the Ubuntu sensor monitor package was used to observe the thermal readings. After an hour of idle time from a cold start, the CPU cores are settled at between 27 and 29 Celsius on the hottest core. This represented a recording of 33 Celsius on the chassis radiator with an ambient room temperature of 27 Celsius. After performing a CPU stress test for 20 minutes, the hottest core peaked at 70 Celsius, with the chassis radiator peaking at 49.5 Celsius, again with a 27 degree ambient temperature. Most importantly, Having concluded the test, the CPU die temperature had dropped to the low 50s within a couple of seconds, indicating that the chassis heatsink is doing its job and is pulling heat away from the die. Somewhat unexpectedly, however, were the cooldown results. In the absence of any active cooling, the case takes a long time to radiate stored heat back out into the environment. After a period of 20 minutes, a lot of the heat was still being retained internally, with CPU cores sitting between 35 and 38 Celsius, although the chassis radiator itself 
had fallen most of its way back towards the pre-stress low of 33 Celsius. From my later observations, once started cold, if the system is being used for light office use, then the die and chassis radiator temperatures will remain consistently low. However, once you begin to use the machine for something more taxing and pump heat into the radiator, in the absence of active thermal cooling, the process of discharging the accumulated heat is very slow. And while the core thermal surge will quickly abate, the die temperature and motherboard temperature will settle between the high 30s and low 40s unless system power management kicks in, instead of returning it to its original temperature in the low to mid 30s. For office productivity purposes, this is an acceptable temperature range. However, if you are looking to run the device at high utilisation for long periods, the case will act as a thermal trap and should not be recommended without some form of active cooling being present across the chassis. For example, should your office have air conditioning, that would be perfect. With that said, these tests are entirely synthetic and represent unreasonable load expectations for all but the most extreme use cases. The maximum core temperature of 70 Celsius is a respectable reading for full load, and it certainly would not worry me as being a thermal ceiling for this device for occasional activities. If there is any weak part of the cooling, it's probably in the primary M.2 stack, with the Wi-Fi and SSD located on top of each other, the idling Wi-Fi chip recording in excess of 66.3 Celsius tucked in beneath the SSD, while both it and the SSD were idling during the test. This suggests that there is a thermal trap between the motherboard, Wi-Fi and SSD sandwich, with only the SSD itself having a hard connection to the chassis base plate. Component selection could be key here. If you do not need the Wi-Fi Bluetooth chip, then don't install it. Equally, I've observed that a 2TB Kingston SNVS stroke 2000G SSD that's found in an Intel pre-built appears to run or idle far cooler to the touch than the 500GB Samsung 970 EVO Plus used in this video. It may thus be the case that further efficiencies can be eked out from sourcing more efficient components. So is it worth it? For what it is, the Acasa Newton TN is an expensive case with limited future use potential. It is, however, extremely well made, hefty, and for the most part, where it counts, a single piece of metal. Under extreme load, the case can become potentially a little too hot to touch without any airflow being present in the room, but this heat abates quickly. The case will also be something that you want to ensure remains free from clutter on your desk so as to not accidentally choke it. Where the Newton TN shines, however, is in adding extra value to the Nook 11. Provision of extra ports is good, but it really does live up to its ability to provide a completely silent running experience. If the case is still open, while there is no mechanical noise from the system at all, your senses will become quickly aware of coil whine and electrical chatter being generated by the CPU and VRMs. With the base plate properly attached, standing the chassis on its feet, the mass of the radiator renders this coil wire completely inaudible, and from a desk width away, the case stands as being completely silent. In contrast to the Newton TN, even with fan curves set in the BIOS to silent, I found the fan on the stock-built Intel Nook to be a high-pitched nuisance while the stock cooler on the Nook 11 TNB V5 board itself, using the same BIOS settings, was markedly better than that on the pre-built, though the fan was still audible. Entombed within the Acasa Newton TN, the Nook is silent. For anyone with moderate PC building experience, the Newton TN should represent a fairly easy PC build, 
and off the back of my experiences is something that I would be happy to recommend to silent PC building enthusiasts for home, home office, commercial office and even media centre use. And that brings us to the end of the video. Thanks for watching all the way through and if you're interested in any of the parts used in this unboxing and build video, please find the links down in the description. Happy silent computing.